Well, we are going to be in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 3, and this is kind of a continuation of last week's message, and so I'll review a little bit, because I know there's some people who weren't here last week. Last week, we were in Hebrews chapter 1, and we've been talking about this new sermon series, Jesus, the answer to every question. And I'll tell you, the reason that we came up with this sermon series, the reason that I decided to to spend so much time talking about who Jesus is. Obviously, he's the only thing that matters. He's the central figure of our faith. He's what everything we know and think should stem from. But when we did another sermon series a while back called, What Does It Mean to Be a Christian? I realized, and, and as I talked to some people about things, I realized that there were a lot of other ideas out there about what it means to be a Christian. It means going to church. It means... um, you get to go to heaven, it means going through some particular uh, pattern of behavior like getting baptized, and all of that stuff is important as it relates to being a Christian, but the substance of your faith is Jesus. Jesus is the the, the core, he's the the solution to our problems, he's the one that, that gives us hope, he's the one that modeled it for us, and he's the one that ushered in our faith through the cross. So everything revolves around him. And I know I've, I've said this before, but if you do a survey of people, just, just ask your friends what heaven will be like. And they'll tell you all about heaven. It'll be streets of gold, and it'll be, you'll get to play golf and eat chocolate and not get fat, and all the stuff that, you know, we, we think we want in life. But a lot of them won't ever mention Jesus. And frankly, if I don't get to do anything at all but be with Jesus for eternity, that should be enough. And so I, I, th- I knew that we needed to expand our view of who Christ was. And so we, we decided to do that. And last week we were in Hebrews chapter 1. And in Hebrews chapter 1, the author of Hebrews told us that Jesus was the creator and the redeemer and the sustainer. And, and that was a beautiful picture of who Christ was. He made everything. He saved us on the cross. And, and he still guides us in our day-to-day life. And and I love that description. And we said we were using the book of Hebrews because it was a great point of reference. The Hebrews were people, the the Jews and the early Christians, a lot of them were Jews, and they, they knew who God was, and they knew the Old Testament. And what they needed was this explanation, this definition for who Christ was, because that changes your faith. It changes your faith from an Old Testament faith to a New Testament faith, from a faith where you follow the rules to a faith where you, you follow Jesus. And, and they needed that picture clarified, who is Jesus. So we started in this book. Well, the author of Hebrews takes this idea that he was the creator, which almost everybody gets. He was the redeemer, which we know the only way to, to God is through the cross, and the sustainer. And in the next few chapters of the book, where we're going to be today, he clarifies that vision. He narrows that down and gives them a better picture even of what that means and what that looks like in their lives. And so, so when I say it's a continuation of last week, it kind of is. If you remember, last week, one of the points we made was that Jesus sustains us. And we used a, a, a parable that Jesus taught about sweeping the house clean. And Jesus says, if, if you sweep your house clean and... The demon that you sweep out of your house goes out and is homeless. The first place he's going to check is back at your place. He's going to say, let's see if the old house is rented. Maybe we can rent it again, you know. And when he shows up, if it's empty, he's going to bring seven friends to live in there. And so you have to put, when you, when you sweep your house clean, when you change your life, when you, when you say, okay, I'm going to follow Jesus, it's more than just stopping the old, old things you used to be doing. You've got to fill your life with something else. And that's what it meant that he's our sustainer. He's the thing we follow. He's the thing we put into our life now so that we can move forward. Well, we didn't didn't go into a lot of detail there. And as the author of Hebrews works forward, I think this section that we're going to read in section chapter 3 is the word picture he gives the Jewish Christians to help fulfill that, to help fill in the, the, the blanks for what it means that he sustains us. Because in this section, and you know, I usually work through the scripture uh, line by line, but I'm going to give you the answers first this week and, and for a reason. 
Usually, when I, when I preach, I, I work through this and, and verse by verse. And, and what the author says here is that there's three ways that Jesus shows up and sustains you and, 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 and fills in the, the gaps in your life and fills in the holes in your life. And, and he says that he is the apostle, the priest, and the son who's in charge of God's household. Those are the three things that he uses. And, and as I read through those, and earlier in the week I made a list of those, and I, I said, okay, this is, where do I want to go with this? I saw a parallel to something in the Old Testament, and a scripture came to mind that made me think of something. And it's important that we always interpret scripture through other scriptures. You're not going to read something, and it's going to mean something completely different than something in the other part of the Bible. You, when Jesus says something, you can use that to, to figure out what everything else means. And Jesus said... I did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. And, and I was pondering on what that meant as I, I taught that earlier in a, the week in a Bible study. And as I looked at this list of things, the apostle and the priest and the son of over God's household, I saw this, this idea of, of him fulfilling the Old Testament with some things in the New Testament. And in the Old Testament, there were three We'll call them offices or characters or, or ways that, that, that God dealt with the people. And they were the prophet, the priest, and the king. And I move forward to the New Testament, to Hebrews, and I know he's talking to Jewish Christians. And when he says apostle, who were the apostles? They were the ones who proclaimed the word to the New Testament church in Acts chapter 2 it says they, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Well, what's the Old Testament? It's the prophets' teaching. And then the priest is the same, and then the king. And in the king, we have a clearly defined king in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, who's the king? Isn't it the son who's over God's household? In the Old Testament, God's household was literally the temple, and the, the throne was in the Holy of Holies. The ark had the cherubim on it. It was the mercy seat of God. It was the throne. In the New Testament, we, we're the house. And, and God's house is really the, the kingdom. That's what Jesus preached when he got there. Repent for the kingdom of God is near. Why was the kingdom near? Because the king of kings was near. Wherever Jesus goes, there the kingdom is. So, so I saw this parallel. Jesus was fulfilling not only the law, but, but the characters of the Old Testament with the New Testament. And the author of Hebrews was giving the Jewish Christians these very real and very understandable characters that Jesus now plugged himself into in the new covenant to fulfill the same roles of the old covenant. And, and it's beautiful because the author here says, Jesus, you know, remember last week he said Jesus is superior to the angels. Okay, and that's, in a heavenly sense, that's a big deal. The angels are, were kind of almost idolized in, in Jewish theology of the time. So in a heavenly sense, Jesus is. He's the creator. We know God created it. Now he boils that down to, to something very earthly and very understandable. And he says in, in verse 3, we're going to get there today, he says Jesus is greater than Moses. Whoa. Now, for us, you know, we read this and we say, yeah, well, yeah, we know that. But can you imagine a first century Jew reading this for the first time? Who is this Jesus guy? Well, I don't know, but he created everything, and he's greater than Moses. He's greater than Moses? Because Moses started everything. Moses was the original prophet and priest and king. Okay, when Moses, in Moses' day, remember, Moses was before the Ten Commandments. Moses was the one who God used to bring about all the rules and all the structure and all the laws. Moses sat in judgment just like the kings did. But he was of a priestly family. He was a Levite. And he got the word of God and gave it to the people. He fulfilled all those roles of prophet, priest, and king. And he says, Jesus is greater than Moses. So he's giving the, the Jews a very focused picture. He takes that prophet, uh, he takes that idea of, of creator, redeemer, and, and sustainer, and now he's putting it into a, a, a smaller, more recognizable package that they can put their finger on and understand. So. All right, let's, let's dig in and see what he has to say here. Chapter 3 of Hebrews, verse 1. He says, therefore, holy brothers who share in the heavenly calling, 
fix your thoughts on Jesus, the apostle and high priest whom we confess. He was faithful to the one who appointed him, just as Moses was faithful in all God's house. All right, so he starts out with therefore. Anytime you see the word therefore, if you've heard me preach at all, you know this. If you see the word therefore, circle it and find out what it's there for. Okay, in this case, what it's there for is everything I just told you. I basically connected chapters 1 and 2 to chapters 3, which is what that word therefore does. He, he says, God is, Jesus is this big character, and he's important. And now, he, because of that, we need to know who he is in our lives, day to day, in, in something we can understand. So that's what the therefore is there for. But he also says, holy brothers who share in the heavenly calling. Now, before we move on, I want you to stop and think for a minute at what he's doing here. Because were the Jewish Christians holy brothers who were sharing in the heavenly calling? The answer is no. They were not holy brothers. Okay, the whole reason Jesus came is because the Jews got it wrong. The Old Testament is an example of how not to follow God. Okay, it's a mess. They didn't get it. They weren't holy. You couldn't be holy on your own. You couldn't follow the rules good enough. Okay, so, so they weren't holy brothers. And now he says, who share in the heavenly blessing. Well, who share in the heavenly calling, I'm sorry. Another, another question, do they share in the heavenly calling? Quite frankly, no. And Paul, no, the author of Hebrews, I'm sorry, knows they don't. If you read some other scripture, like the book of Galatians, he argues that just being a Jew isn't enough. Without Jesus, nobody gets to heaven. So he's writing to Jewish people, perhaps Jewish Christians, but maybe not. And he's telling them that he's calling them holy, and he's saying, you're brothers in Christ, but I'm not sure they are. And I know he's not sure they are. So what's he doing? Well, He's doing a couple things, I think. The first thing he's doing is a hook. When I went to school, they taught us if you're going to teach a Bible study or preach a sermon or do anything, you have a hook. You get something out there to get their attention. And I think he's, he's gathering them in. I think he's pulling them in. He's, he's giving them something to get their attention. We're still early in the book. And this is a new point that he's making. Yeah, but I think there's a little more than that. Remember, we're dealing with people who understand what it means to be holy people. They thought they were God's people. They understood what following the rules looked like, even though they weren't doing it. They understood holiness. And they thought that they were the chosen people. They thought that, that they were the ones called. And I think what he's saying to them, ever so slightly, is, this is who you think you are. This is who you want to be. I'm about to tell you how you can get there. This is who, for us, the message is, if we want to be holy, and we want to share in the heavenly calling, this is who we've got to have Christ be in the center of our lives. Now, this is a quick little introduction. But, and, and, and not being Jewish, sometimes we just skip right over it and think, eh, there's something there. There's something in a book written to Hebrews. And what he's telling them is, listen up. Listen up, because this is who you can be if you let Jesus be this in your life. So the first thing he says is, he's the apostle and the high priest that we confess, and I love that. He could just say he's the apostle and the high priest, but he said he's the apostle and high priest that we confess. He immediately confronts them with, are you in or not? See, because if you're sitting here and you're thinking, eh, I don't know, guess what you're going to get out of this? Eh, I don't know. That's it. You know, what you bring in is what you take out. Without faith, we got nothing. But if you're thinking, oh, I believe in Jesus, Okay, well, now here's what you say you believe. First, he's the apostle. Now, I don't know um, how much you connect apostle and prophet, and I, I knew that connection, but I never really made anything of it until I began to, to work through this. And, and as, again, as I looked through Jesus' statement that said, I've not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it, I now saw all kinds of connections, Old Testament to New. And I believe that the apostles are the New Testament version of the prophet. I believe that, that uh, there's a, a very real sense to which New Testament prophecy is preaching. Okay? I'm just telling you what God says. That's all the prophets did. That's what I'm doing. Okay? So, so I've already made that connection, but 
The Phillips translation of the Bible uses the word messenger. And that's even more related to the word prophet. Okay? So, and I love this because remember last week we looked at the word the. Very important little Greek word. It doesn't say Jesus is an apostle. It says he's the apostle. Greek word tun. The apostle and high priest whom we confess. So now we don't just have any old messenger. He's the messenger. So the first thing I think he tells them is, you've got a teacher. You've got a messenger. You better listen. Last week, I know I told you that sometimes the message isn't just what Jesus says, but it's who he is. He's the messenger. That's important. But sometimes we do need to listen to what he says. It's amazing how many people will actually think about Jesus and, and kind of what he did. Oh, he spent time with sinners but not look at what he said. And what he said to those sinners was, stop sinning. Okay, so sometimes we do have to take his words. And in fact, I would argue that we already know that. It's interesting. He was talking to the Jews, and they, the Jews, you know, they, they taught their children, very similar to how we do. School hasn't changed in 2,000 years. Okay? They were, their education system and how they gathered the kids up and had a teacher, very similar to what we do. So we get this. You've got to teach people. And Jesus taught people. Okay, so what? What do he teach us? If he's the teacher, one of the things that you plug into our lives with Jesus is listening to his words and learning from his teaching. What do he teach us? Well, I would argue you could pick anything in the Bible and get something out of it. I just looked through the Gospels and found sections that had a lot of red. And I picked Luke. And this is really, I didn't even do much research. I just picked one. I picked Luke chapter 12, and I decided I was going to outline it. Just in Luke chapter 12. First thing he says in verse 1, be on your guard against hypocrisy. That's a pretty good lesson. That's something we could all use. Okay? Be on your guard against hypocrisy. Verse 4, do not be afraid of those who are ungodly. Wow. That's some deep stuff. And I just picked a chapter at random. Verse 8, if you want to be successful, acknowledge God. Nice. Verse 11, do not worry. Wow. In fact, he spends 10 uh, verses 22 to 32 discoursing on faith and how faith in God should overcome worry. And again, I just picked this out at random, and there's two things I know that apply to three quarters of the people in the room. Verse 16 through 21, he gives a parable about the rich fool. The rich fool, uh, he, he made a lot of money, his crops produced a lot, and he said, Ah, I don't need to work anymore, I can, I can live on that, I'll be fine. And then the angel came and took his life away. He said, you don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. You're a fool. Okay? This is just in one random chapter. Verse 35, he tells us that we should be dressed and ready. How many of us miss what Jesus says to us because we're not paying attention? We, we pay attention on Sunday morning, but not on Tuesday afternoon. Okay? Verse 49, he talks about division, but... He doesn't say we should be unified. He says, I came to bring a sword and divide mother from from daughter and father from son. (gasps) What? What he says is, the only thing that should matter is me. I take priority. He doesn't say that family's not important, but he says, if you put your family relationships ahead of your relationship with me, it's idolatry. Yikes. And then, verse 54 through 59, you know what he discourses on? The end times. Wow. So here, just one random chapter. This is Luke chapter 12. There's three or four really big, important topics that we day-to-day face. Jesus taught on them. So I guess my question would be, if he's the apostle, and we we say, what are we going to, and they talk about him sustaining us, what are we going to fill our life in with? Um, The Bible? That's the answer. Okay? Get yourself a good Bible that's got red stuff in it, and read the red stuff twice. If you're reading through the scriptures, read the whole thing, it all matters, but read the red stuff twice, because that's what came out of Jesus' mouth. Okay, so so we've got to, and and I love what what the author says here. He says, fix your thoughts. One of the reasons people think Paul wrote this is because there's so many parallels to other things Paul wrote. Romans chapter 12, what's it say? Don't be like the world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Okay? Fix your thoughts. Renew your mind. What do you put in your mind? The Word of God. 
Very simple. That's what the apostle taught. It goes with Acts chapter 2, one of our favorite verses. What did the early church, the first day they were Christians, what did they do? They devoted themselves to the apostle's teaching. He's the apostle. Okay? He's the teacher of teachers. You better learn what he said. Okay? So that's the, that's the, he's the perfect prophet. He's the fulfilled prophet. All right. So he says he's the prophet and the priest. Now, I, I love this because we, especially non Catholics, in the Christian world, have lost a sense of what the priesthood means. Okay? The priesthood was very important. In the Old Testament, they had the prophets. We love them because they preach. And the priests and the kings. The priests interceded. They interceded for people. The job of the priest was to go to God and do what the people could not. And there was a whole series of rules and what they had to do to clean themselves. And that's because they were sinners too. And God set up the rules so that we would realize that we're all a mess. But you can't just come to God. None of us are allowed to just go to God. Hey, God, how's it going? If that happened, boom, we'd be dead. Because we're sinners. We're a mess. We're a wreck. Now, in the New Testament, we can just go to God, right? No, not without the blood of Jesus. It's Jesus' sacrifice that makes us able to go to God. So literally... He's the, the high priest because of the cross. All this intercession, all this go-between, me and God, we needed one final high priest. We needed one final sacrifice. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time there because we're going to get to that later in this sermon series. We're going to spend a whole week on just how the redemption, how, how that works. But that's, the, that's the, the primary intercession. That's what makes him the high priest. Is the, He's the last, the final, the best, the perfect go-between. But what we need to learn and grasp from him, from, as, as, as the, the author of this book says, he's, the, he's the, the, the last prophet or the apostle and the priest. What he wants us to plug in is that not only did Jesus do that, but he continues to do that. That's his attitude towards us, is one of caring and interceding. Okay, Listen to what he says in Luke 13. Jerusalem, Jerusalem. You who kill the prophets and stone those who sent, sent to you. How often have I longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you are not willing. Okay, let me, let me rephrase that. Jesus says to you, oh, you're a sinner. You're messing up. But I still want to help you. I still want to help you. Now, that goes directly against the lie that the world teaches us that you got to fix your life before you can come to God. I've had friends, good friends, tell me, oh, man, I've been wanting to go to church, but i got to get some things straightened around first. Hello? How do you get them straight without God? Okay, it doesn't make any sense. It's a lie the world tells us. Jesus as the priest means that he is, is longing to meet us where we are. Now, he's not going to let you stay there. I guarantee you. If you really meet him, he'll say, let's go. Go and sin no more. I could read that a hundred times. He wants to meet you where you are. So He's going to teach you. Yeah, but he also comforts you. Okay? He's the comforter. We call this in, in the church currently pastoral care. Okay? But my job is prophet, priest, and king. And I know everybody hates the king part, but I'll tell you what it means in a minute. It's not that bad. Okay? Prophet meaning I preach. Priest meaning I do pastoral care. We're supposed to intercede, not just me for you, but us for each other or for following Christ. And we learn that from him. We plug that into our lives. What's that look like lived out? I'll tell you. I'll tell you what it looks like lived out. At the end of our praise time, we open up this altar and people pray for one another. And I prayed with a couple people second service. But first service, I didn't get a chance to. You know why? Because I, I, I started to walk towards one person and two people came to them. I started to walk towards someone else and two people came to them. And I started to go to somebody else and one of the elders went to them. And, and there was another lady, but she was with her husband. And he was clearly praying over her, which is how this is supposed to look. Okay? It was beautiful. The pastor didn't need to do any pastoring because people were pastoring each other. That's the life of Christ being lived out as the priests. 
Okay, that's what we plug in, ministering to each other. One of the things that, that, that the author of Hebrews is saying to them, okay, how does it look like that he sustains us? Learn from him. Minister to each other like him. Okay? And we, we know when you read through here, you see all these healings. They're not just physical. You know, we read about lots of healings in here, but some of them are emotional. I love the woman at the well story. Jesus heals that woman, and he doesn't do anything. In fact, he calls her out. Remember, he says, go get your husband. And he must have just snickered. Go get your husband. She says, oh, I don't have a husband. He says, yeah, I know. You don't have a husband. You've had four husbands, and the guy you're living with now isn't your husband. She was like, uh. So he confronts her, and then what? He doesn't say, get away from me, evil woman. He says, hey, why don't we go to your house and have supper? She gets completely restored. She starts leading other people to him. Beautiful, beautiful story. He doesn't just heal people physically. He heals them emotionally. We're called, and spiritually, we're called to be a part of that for each other. So, he's the prophet in the New Testament. He's the priest in the New Testament. And we're supposed to be both those things. And then, he goes into this thing about the house. He talks about the house of God, Moses being a servant in the household of God, and Jesus being a son over God's house. What's this house thing? Okay, well, frankly, what is God's house? To the Jews, they would have had no problem understanding what God's house was. When you said God's house, they thought temple. It's a temple. When, who is the king of the, at the temple? God. The, the throne is the ark. That's the mercy seat of God, it's called. Okay? That's the throne. It's in the throne room. It's in the inner part of the, of the, the temple, the castle, if you want to call it that. God sits on that throne. And Jesus is his son. What happens in the, the, in the Old Testament with kings and sons? The son becomes the king, doesn't he? And the son has authority over everything that the, 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 the king has authority over. And so the message then is that Jesus is the king. And he calls him that later on. If you keep reading, again, uh, this whole book of Hebrews has this one theme in it. And if you keep going, when you get to Hebrews chapter 7, it is said that Jesus is the same as Mechizeldek. Uh-oh. Who's Mechizeldek? Mechizeldek was an Old Testament figure that had, had special lore in Jewish history. A lot of you know, but I'll explain. Abram, soon to become Abraham, goes out and he wins a battle. And one of the kings is the king of Sodom. And on the way back, the king of Sodom meets him. Well, who do you think in this little story the king of Sodom represents? Well, I don't know about you, but I think the king of Sodomy is probably the devil. Okay? And so this king of Sodom meets him and then shows up immediately, it says in uh, Genesis 14, this other figure, Mechizeldek. And Mechizeldek is said to be the king of Salem and a priest of God. But here's the beautiful thing. The king of Salem, Jerusalem wasn't even a city yet. And a priest of God, the priesthood hadn't been set up yet. So he's the king of a city that doesn't exist and the priest of a religion that doesn't exist. Huh. Go figure. Who was it? Well, we know the word Salem, shalom in Hebrew, means peace. He was the king of peace. And he was a priest of God. Our God. The God. This was Jesus. God, well, it was God in human form. I call him Jesus. Theology professors will get mad at you for that, but we're not going to split hairs. Okay? This was God in human form. God, Jesus, showed up in the Old Testament. The Hebrews knew this story. They knew that God made appearances and put his foot down. And when Satan came to tempt Abram, God showed up in person and said, I don't think so, he's mine. And it says they took communion together, and then it says that Abram gave him a tenth of everything he had, which is kind of cool because it was 400 years before the rules had been written about tithing. And so what happens is God shows up and Abram says, I'm going to worship God. And then Abram leaves and the king of Sodom says, hey, give me some stuff. And Abram says, hit the road, Jack. God told me not to give anything to you. It's a cool story. You should read it. Okay, so, so the Jews know there's this figure. It says he's the king of Salem. It says he's the king of righteousness in that story. He shows up a little later on as if, as if the son of God isn't enough that he's the king. In, in chapter 7 of Hebrews, the author says, Jesus was better than Mechizeldek. He says Jesus was equal to Mechizeldek. Mechizeldek was God. He was the king from heaven, showed up to be king on earth. 
So it's clear who, who the author here is pointing to Jesus being. So what's it mean that he's king? Now, this is simple. Because it's so, so simple. You can't, how do you plug Jesus into your day-to-day life? Well, you listen to his teaching. Okay? You let him comfort you, and then you comfort others with that comfort. And then you better submit to him. He's the king, and he's on a throne, and you walk up to the king, there is one appropriate response. Throughout scripture, watch a movie, any movie you've ever seen about kings, watch Lord of the Rings, they get it right. Everywhere in the Bible, there's one response to a king, what is it? Sometimes he'd chop your head off, didn't matter, you kneeled anyway and prayed for grace. He promises mercy. That's the response. So how do you plug Jesus into your life? You listen to his teaching. You let him comfort you, and you comfort others with, that, others with that comfort, and you submit. You submit. If he says it goes, we can call it obedience, we can call it submission, we can call it hitting the knees, we can call it anything we want, but Jesus is first and I'm second. Everything I think better line up with what he thinks. I like to say I don't think anything. He tells me what to think. That's what it looks like. This was, this was how the author defined this, this sustaining. How does God sustain you? How does Jesus plug in in your day-to-day life? He teaches you, he comforts you, and you submit to him. It's very simple. It's very simple. And let me end with this thought. Why? Why bother? Why does he need, why can't he just end with chapter 1 and go right to chapter 9 where he starts teaching other stuff? Why does he need 3 or 4 or 5 or 7 chapters to define for us who Jesus is? Isn't creator and redeemer and sustainer enough? The answer is it should be. But we're too smart for our own good. We have this tendency to take the things of God and use them for our sake. And he wants to make sure that doesn't happen. He wants to make sure that we know who God is in here. We want to make sure, he wants to make sure that the Jesus we're worshiping isn't the one we've, we, we'd like. You know, like, God will make you rich if you forward this Facebook thing. I, I, I don't know who that is. My Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. Sometimes life is hard. He doesn't promise us roses and sunshine. Well, he does, but not till this earth is long gone. We get that for eternity, but now it might be hard. What he says is, I'll never leave you and forsake you. He walks through it with us. The reason he keeps narrowing this teaching down, the reason he keeps focusing us on Jesus is because we've got to make sure that we don't run with this thing ourselves, but we do what he says to do, and that the actual God of the Bible is the God that we're following. Let me take some time and pray. Lord, I thank you for loving us. And Father, I thank you that the author of this book continued Continue to give us a clearer and clearer and clearer picture, Lord, of who Jesus is. Father, I pray. I pray that we would listen to his teaching, and I pray that we would allow him to bless us, comfort us, teach us, guide us, and Father, that we would share that with the world. And Father, most importantly, I pray that we would submit to the king. He's the king of kings, Lord, and I pray that we would understand that everything he says goes, and everything he says is true, and everything he teaches us in his word is, is how we should be living, Lord, and that we would take that and know that even though it's hard and even though things might not always go the way we think they should, Lord, that they will bless us if we will follow through with them. Lord, help us to have that kind of faith. We thank you for loving us enough to send your son in his name that we pray. Amen. We are not all we can be in Christ, and there are too many hurting people, unsaved people, Christian people that need encouraged. There's too much ministry to go that needs done for us to settle. For us to say, oh, be like the Pharisees and say, thank God I'm not like them.